All right. So a couple things real quick before we go through our main reminders. I apologize for blowing up web courses this, over the past two days with a couple of random announcements. Um, the first announcement about makeup exams. I don't like being that strict, but the problem is, is if I wait till after like three or four days after to find out if it was an excused absence or not, it gets really difficult on my end to verify things and all that kind of fun stuff. So please, if you have an excused reason for not being here on Friday for your exam, let me know either ahead of time or by Monday this time of day. And again, the reason for that is so I can keep track of y'all and make sure that everybody who's supposed to take the exam can take the exam because just not showing up because you overslept is it an excused absence, right? Like if you're sick, that's one thing. If you've got like a religious exemption or something like that, that's another thing entirely. But if you're supposed to be here, you should be here. Um, all right, so let's do a couple of quick reminders. Uh, quiz three is due on Sunday, September 12th at 11.59 p.m. If you haven't figured out, there's a bit of a pattern to this. Um, again, I really recommend taking advantage of taking it a little bit early, considering that this is the last lecture before your first exam. So use it as a bit of a way to practice before you have to take very similar questions that are gonna be on your exam to this. The exam is uh, coming up as well. Remember that it is in person here on next, or this upcoming Friday at 12.30, we will be starting. So if you do come in a little bit late, please try to be quiet. So that way you're not disturbing others. You do not need to bring a Scantron and you know, bring a pencil. You're gonna need to be able to fill it out. If you have to miss it for an excused absence, again, let me know. Because there's so many there's so much weirdness with everybody's different quarantine schedules and all that other kind of fun stuff. Um, the makeup exams are online. It's the exact same test, the exact same thing, but the only way you can do that is if you have an excused absence for why you can't be here on Friday. All right. It's through the Respondus uh, browser too, so it's a pain in the ass. Nobody likes it. It's a little bit invasive, but it's still, it's as close as I can get to being in person. Because uh, unfortunately, what we were running into is um, I would have three or four students that all try to, you know, do a makeup exam at one time, and I can only be here so often. Like next week, I've got to be out for two days because um, a family member of mine is having surgery. So, you know, those first two days are going to be a little bit hairy for me. And, you know, I can't, you know, lose my entire week too just to do makeup exams. So that's going to be the easiest way to do it. If you end up having to go that route, it's open the entire of next week, you get one shot at it, 50 minutes, exactly the same as in here. But again, excused absences only, all right? All right. Remember too, that the exam is over all the first like six chapters. So we'll try to get through, I think today's a little bit of a long lecture. So I'll try not to dilly dally on this one. Again, in person at 12.30, 50 minutes for 34 questions, roughly about a minute and a half per those of you that take essay, or take the test through SAS, you're gonna take that over in Feral Commons. I believe there's a, the, uh, an SAS building or something right in there that you'll actually take the test. But I think you have to schedule that with them. Um, don't contact me, you have to contact them. All right. One thing I kind of wanted to point out, there's a lot of reasons why you can do really poor, poorly on a test. There's some psychological ones or physiological ones, sorry. Um, you need to make sure that you actually eat a breakfast or lunch before you come in here. It'll help your brain function, I promise. And don't, you know, stay up all night studying for this exam. One, it's really not that hard of an exam. And two, you're going to be exhausted. And you're not going to do well. So make sure you actually get some sleep. As far as psychological goes, um, you know, relax. I promise you, it's not that hard of a test. You've seen a lot of these questions before. And if you have any sort of like stress or anxiety about it, feel free to reach out. We've all been there. Uh, don't spend a ton of time or revisiting material. Remember that you should have been spending a lot of time just kind of learning this as you go through, not just trying to memorize everything the day before. And if you do that, you're gonna have way too much information on your head and you're just not gonna be able to get through it. So just make sure you're, you've been studying. And if you have it, you got two days. So take advantage of that time. And unfortunately, there is a chance that it could just be a bad test. I make mistakes. I accidentally put wrong answers. It should be correct this time because, you know, it's been through at least a round of y'all 
So hopefully, but there's still a chance that I might have missed something. So if you see something that seems a little off or doesn't make sense, feel free to call me on it. I'm human. I make mistakes. And, you know, if it's something that is a mistake on my end, I'll work with you. If it's not, there's not much I can do, okay? All right, so let's finish up this last chapter, which is about respiration and fermentation, as well as we'll get to photosynthesis here in a little bit. So as we kind of talked about, organisms need energy, right? To be able to function and maintain homeostasis. In order to do that, they need to acquire food and oxygen. Now plants make their own food, but animals such as this bluebird are gonna eat food, which gives them that energy they need. They're those consumers. They're the, um, what's another word for it? Um, heterotrophs, we'll, and we'll get more to those terms later. Um, most organisms also are going to require oxygen, which is required for cellular respiration in order to be able to break down and create those innate or ATPs that we were talking about last week. Now, cells use this energy in food to make ATP. The molecules in food, such as glucose, which is a you know, simple sugar, you know, is, you know, monosaccharide, are used to produce ATP, the energy carrier molecule that's used to power cell activities. Right? This is somewhat of a review, right? Now, cellular respiration is this process that makes ATP. All organisms from trees to whales to bacteria are going to use some form of cellular respiration, and it does kind of differ a little bit between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And this potential energy stored in glucose is going to be extracted and put into ATP, so it's a very readily accessible form of energy for that cell or for that organism overall. Now, ATP is a form of energy that cells are able to use. We've talked about this a bit already, right? ATP is essential because it powers nearly every cellular activity that uses energy. And cells use ATP to do things like just move around or move things within themselves through either active transport or muscle contractions. But they're also really helpful for you know, creating powerful chemical reactions that help keep us alive. Now, there's two different kinds of forms. You have aerobic and anaerobic. Now, aerobic cellular respiration means that you're going to be using oxygen for it. So in this case, the overall equation for this, and you don't really need to know this 100%, but um, it's C6H1206, which is glucose, plus oxygen, yields carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. The reactants are the glucose and the oxygen, and the products are the carbon dioxide, the water, and the ATP. Now, cellular respiration uh, includes three main pathways. You have glycolysis, which is where glucose is split in half, forming what they call pyruvate. And some of the energy is transferred to the electrons, whereas a lot of its very small amount is actually transferred back into ATP. Now, in the Krebs cycle, that derivative uh, pyruvate is oxidized and CO2 is released. This, again, is going to release more and more electrons they're going to then move into what we call the electron transport chain, that final step. In that electron transport chain, energy from electrons is used to form ATP. Basically, it moves electrons down a gradient and ultimately it generates ATP that way. And oxygen is ultimately the final electron receptor. So that's where you're getting that CO2 and water from everything. Now, cellular respiration relies on oxidation reduction reactions. So those uh, deoxygen. Um, and the pathways for aerobic respiration release energy by oxidizing glucose and reducing oxygen. Remember, reducing means to add negative charge to it. Remember, you're decreasing the charge, whereas oxidizing means you're increasing the charge of something. Now, since oxygen strongly attracts electrons, the reaction is considered downhill. The electrons move from like a high gradient to a low gradient, and that, move, or that movement down that gradient is what's actually releasing that energy. Think of it as kind of like a, a water wheel or a mill or something like that, where the force of water that's pushing past a dam or a water wheel or something like that is enough that it turns that mill and is able to grind up things like grits or you know power electricity, that kind of thing. Now, cellular respiration occurs in very small steps. Um, cellular respiration is going to release energy uh, via glucose one bond at a time. And, and then it's going to go through kind of a series of those lot of small little steps. And if all energy were released at once, way too much of it would be lost to heat. 
Because remember, that's kind of the primary way energy is given off, right? So we want to try to conserve as much of that energy that, that we're releasing and put that into ATP compared to everything else. These small steps allow for cells to store more of that released energy in ATP than they would otherwise. Now, where exactly does cellular respiration take place? Now, glycolysis is always going to occur in the cytosol. So in prokaryotes, a Krebs cycle takes place in the cytosol. And the ETC, the electron transport chain, is found within the cellular membrane. However, in eukaryotic cells, we're going back to the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Remember, this is where it gets its name from. Where it's a specialized organelle, likely derived from another you know, little single-celled organism at some point. That's where they specifically target and run the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So you're not reliant on running it all the way through your cellular membrane. You have more surface area to run everything through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, basically, he asked if um, glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of the mitochondria. And to my knowledge, it doesn't. Um, it, the mitochondria is basically designed to only get through those last two steps at like the highest you know, rate possible. So, uh, but I may be wrong on that, but the good news is it's not on the test. So don't worry about it too much. Now the mitochondria is gonna produce the most ATP for anything. Aerobic cellular respiration taps much of the potential energy stored in glucose. Um, and that Krebs cycle in the electron transport chain, which occurs inside of the mitochondria, in eukaryotic cells are the key to generating so much ATP through that process. Let's get a little bit more specific here. Now, glycolysis is universal. All cells carry out glycolysis and glycolysis requires many steps, all of which occur in the cytosol. We're not gonna get too far into the weeds because we just don't have that kind of time, but know that there's a ton of steps to this process. Now, none of these steps require oxygen, so cells that use glycolysis and can both in both oxygen-rich, aerobic, or oxygen-free anaerobic environments. Yeah. As far as the credit or all the stuff with the um, cellular respiration, the big point I want you to take home from this is how it happens in a general sense, like going through those three big steps and not get too stuck into the weeds. Because if we were say in a major cell biology course, we'd spend two, three lectures going through and making sure you knew every single little step and how to do it. But in here, we just don't have that kind of time because we want to show y'all a little bit of anatomy, a little bit of physiology, a little bit of ecology. So we'll just know the big picture items. And honestly, you'll see when you take the quiz for this week, that it, it tries to keep fairly, um, you know, from dropping down too deep. Um, the transition step is going to form an acetyl CoA. And the transition step, the two molecules of pyruvate are, convert, are converted into two molecules of acetyl CoA. And that electron carrier NADA picks up two, uh, two electrons as well as forming two molecules of NADH. This reaction is going to release those two molecules of CO2. So remember, this is a kind of that transitionary step before it gets into uh, starting the Krebs cycle. Now, the Krebs cycle is going to oxidize this acetyl-CoA. Um, and basically, that just means that the acetyl-CoA molecules are going to be disassembled during the Krebs cycle. And they're going to be, uh, their carbons are going to rele be released as two molecules of CO2. And the energy from the acetyl-CoA is going to be transferred into electrons carried by NADH and FADH2. And then this electron transport chain is going to transfer the energy to ATP. So electrons from the NADH and the FADH2, which are basically just kind of bins to carry things around, right, are unloaded into the electron transport chain for their final series of redox reactions. The potential energy from these electrons is used to produce a proton H plus gradient. And these H plus ions move through the enzyme ATP synthase, releasing energy. <laughs> 
that ATP synthase is going to use that energy to then generate ATP. Oxygen is going to accept these depleted electrons. So as the electrons are passed down the electron transport chain, they're going to lose energy bit by bit because ultimately energy is never created or destroyed. So if you're using energy for other things, the things that stored that energy are no longer going to have it, right? And so as these electrons are being passed down, um, ultimately they're going to end up with no energy left to burn off of those electrons. And so the final electron at receptor is oxygen which is gonna combine with those H plus ions that we created and form water. Now aerobic respiration can yield up to 36 ATP per reaction. So a single molecule of glucose is gonna create 36 ATP. The glycolysis is only gonna produce two of that. Um, and this is usually not enough to keep cells alive, right? The Krebs cycle is going to produce two ATP, but again, most of that energy in the glucose is stored in electrons. It's that electron transport chain that's going to produce all of that extra ATP. I think that's a mistake. It should say 32. I think that was a mistake by the book on that one. Now, cellular respiration is not always aerobic, right? There's bacterium and stuff that live at the bottom of the ocean. There's ones that live in the hydrothermal vents that are inside the supervolcano that is um, Yellowstone. There's a lot of weird places where bacteria are able to thrive, right? Things like yeast, which is a little uh, fungus, right? Breathing water um, It's because it can switch between aerobic and anaerobic. So it'll primarily focus on that aerobic um, way of generating energy for cellular respiration when it can, but when there's no more oxygen in that environment, like when you're fermenting beer, that's when it's gonna switch to that anaerobic form. Now remember the glycolysis, the glycolysis that produces ATP, it doesn't require oxygen, right? So fermentation is what allows glycolysis to produce ATP. Now, many prokaryotes and some eukaryotic cells like yeast use fermentation. There is no Krebs cycle or electron transport chain because they don't have that oxygen available to use as an elect or as a electron receptor, right? So fermentation simply allows the glycolysis to continue producing smaller and smaller amounts of ATP. So it's not as good, but at least gets you close. Now, um, one thing I do like to point out that alcohol generated through spirits is done in a very different way. Um, and it's kind of a cool fact that I don't know if uh, some of y'all are probably over the age of 21, hopefully. Um, for those of you that have just been walking through, say, Publix or what have you, you've noticed that the sparkling seltzers and all that stuff have like shot off in the last two, three years, right? Like that's completely taken over huge spaces of what used to be the considered the alcohol aisles, right? Now, what's really fascinating about this is there's two ways to primarily generate alcohol when you're talking about from a food production standpoint. You can distill it, which is where you use the properties of water and heating up water to certain conditions that you can boil off the water and just keep the alcohol separate. That's usually the easiest way for things like whiskey, moonshine, vodka. That's usually how you're getting those really high concentrations of alcohol. However, when uh, you use organisms like yeast or others. Um, there's a couple different bacterial strains that if you've ever had um, a lot of sour beers, that's usually what that's coming from. They're the ones that are using fermentation. So distillation is usually just used as like a, a chemical or a physical process, whereas fermentation is usually a biologically fed process. There's yeast involved of some sort or some sort of bacterial cell that's converting the sugars that are in you know, wine or beer or anything like that and turning that into alcohol. That's kind of the products of fermentation, right? Um, and what's really interesting is because of the way our laws are written in this country, you tax differently based off of your fermentation drink or a distillation drink. It doesn't matter the percentage of alcohol or anything like that. So you could be a 0% alcohol beer or you could be a distilled beer, which probably doesn't really happen often. 
and one would have to be in the little side liquor stores outside of the Publix, and the other one would have to be in the one in, uh, that could actually be sold inside the store. And it's kind of interesting when you look at things like wine especially, where you can have the same concentration of wine or same alcohol concentration in some wines as some spirits, but they're allowed to be sold in the Publix and not the Publix liquor store because of how it's distilled. That's where that difference is coming in. So just something kind of neat that directly relates to something we're talking about today. All right, so we're gonna go back and jump back to chapter five real quick and talk about photosynthesis. I figured that it's, now that we know what the sugar is being used for, we should talk about how some organisms are able to create that sugar. Now life at a lot of places ultimately depends on photosynthesis or at least some sort of autotroph, right? Now autotrophs like this plant are gonna use photosynthesis to capture energy from the sun. Now, again, I do wanna reiterate that not all autotrophs use sunlight through photosynthesis. There are other ways to do it, especially if you're talking about some of the critters that live down in like the deep sea vents in the Marianas Trench. A lot of those are going to use what we call chemosynthesis, which is very, very similar, but uses different products to get to the, very, to the similar kind of response. Now, photosynthetic, uh, synthetic organisms are considered producers. And pretty much in 99% of ecosystems, they're considered the base. The, you know, the, if you don't have that, you're not going to have a functioning ecosystem. Now, that's not 100% true all, in all cases, but in most, especially if you're talking about uh, the biomes that occur in the US, Africa, Asia, as long as you're not in like a desert biome where there's a lot more minimal uh, plant vegetation, that kind of thing, or say in like the taiga or tundra, your most of your organisms and your ecosystem are gonna be focused around living off of those autotrophs producing energy as plants or algae. Another big example of this not being quite the case is marine systems. Marine systems are a huge caveat to most things just because they're so different. But most fish, especially, there's no like producer usually at the base of the food chain in a lot of places. It's just kind of, kind of, most things are kind of considered consumers at that point. Now, photosynthesis is going to help convert uh, sunlight and water to energy. Photosynthesis is the process of converting light kinetic energy into chemical stored energy, usually in some sort of glucose or something like that, that can then be broken down and used for cellular respiration. So more specifically, photosynthesis is gonna produce some sort of sugar. Now photosynthesis is a series of chemical reactions that use light and energy, as well as CO2 from the air, to assemble molecules of glucose together and kind of create some other carbohydrates as well. That's why if you've ever just like, how many of y'all have ever just like opened up a honeysuckle and sucked out the juice inside? Notice how like sweet it is? It's all the sugars that are being built up. Yeah. You had a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so that sugar is gonna be used as a crucial food source. Animals, fungi, and other consumers are going to eat the producers. And that sugar that was used in cellular respiration to make that ATP for uh, cells to eventually use, right? So not only is the plant probably feeding, primarily focused on feeding itself, by existing in this environment, you have things that have evolved to eat those other plants and allow them to utilize that same energy. Which has kind of led into this evolutionary arms race of how can plants package their glucose in ways that they aren't as accessible for animals to eat so that way they're no longer tasting? You know, um, a great example of this is there are grasses that have literal pieces of glass embedded in little silica crystals because they're trying to destroy whatever herbivore might be wanting to come along and eat it. There's ways that things have kind of adapted to, know, to not just be a, a feast sitting out there like a buffet. Now sunlight is gonna power this photosynthesis and photosynthetic organisms need a few simple ingredients to make their own molecules of sugar. Simply they need sunlight energy 
a carbon dioxide molecule and a molecule of water. And when they combine all these things together, that's ultimately gonna yield a thing of glucose and oxygen. Now, oxygen is considered a byproduct of this photosynthesis. In fact, if you are really curious, the concentration of oxygen in the, on the planet has always been fluctuating. And so you hear, you know, climate change and everybody's kind of focused on things in kind of a very like small time scale. But if you want to look at like the greater picture of how much the earth has changed, there was a point in time when there, the oxygen content in the earth's atmosphere was less than 5%. But now it's closer to 30. That's a huge shift if you think about it. All of that was generated through photosynthesis. Now remember, the reason why this worked is the sun's going to emit energy in waves, that ultraviolet radiation that you've probably more than likely felt at the beach. Um, and these shorter wavelengths are going to have higher energy than longer wavelengths. So things like infrared, or sorry, ultraviolet x-rays, gamma rays, those really small short wavelengths are gonna move that energy from the sun into whatever systems that are occurring here on the earth. Now, visible light is only one part of the sun's energy. Um, and so only some of these wavelengths are visible to us as we perceive these as you know, colors or all that sort of stuff. Um, but there's a lot more of the sun rays that we're not able to detect. And that's usually where the energy that is being used for photosynthesis is. And what's really cool is if you look at a lot of plants, and you look at them and blast them with either UV lights or uh, ultraviolet lights, you can actually see differentiating patterns where the leaf is designed to kind of funnel sunlight in particular directions, as well as you know, help to help organisms that can see in that kind of spectrum to be able to see things and you know, know where to go when it comes to pollination and that sort of stuff. Now, photons are the packets of that light energy. That's how it's actually moving from one place to another. And plants and other photosynthesizers are going to capture those photons of visible light and use that to create their um, glucose molecules. Now, certain pigments are better able to capture light than others. Now, for context, the pigment are molecules that are helped to design ca and capture energy from light. And pigments found in plants that specialize in absorbing energy from different wavelengths are typically green, because that, for whatever reason, is that perfect wavelength that's better able to extract the energy it needs from, those, uh, from the sun and turn that and be able to use that for photosynthesis. Chlorophyll A is the main photosynthetic pigment in plant. And each type of pigment absorb um, a little bit differently. So for instance, uh, you have chlorophyll B in those car or carotenoids that also can be used for Ultimately, it's this green light that's reflected back because it's uh, absorbing all the other uh, parts of that light spectrum, which is why we perceive leaves to be green. It's one of those weird, funky things about color and light and all that kind of fun stuff. You're only seeing what's being bounced back. You're not seeing what is um, usually being you know, absorbed. Now, plant leaves contain what we call mesophyll cells. This is where gas, gas exchange is going to occur inside the leaf pores called stomata. And these mesophyll cells are also going to contain something called chloroplasts. Now, chloroplasts are kind of very similar to mitochondria, where we think they derived from some sort of other single celled organism and got kind of consumed by another organism and ultimately became kind of this weird endosymbiont thing. These chloroplasts are large organelles that are found in the plant and algal cells and a couple of other things. And most photosynthetic cells contain between 40 to 200 chloroplasts. Now in eukaryotes, chloroplasts are where photosynthesis is going to primarily take place. So how this works within the chloroplast, in each chloroplast of the, of the mesophyll cell, there's going to be several stacks of a membrane called thylakoid. pigment molecules in the thylakoid are going to help capture sunlight itself. So that's where all that chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B is going to be sitting. That's why you get those bright green chloroplasts. You're seeing all the little uh, thylakoids reflecting back at you. 
And then photosynthesis is going to be occurring in this weird photosystem. So a photosystem is a large protein structure in the thylakoid membrane. So the photosystem consists of an antenna pigment, a reaction center that contains, the, and then a reaction center that contains that chlorophyll. You're not going to need to know that much of this, I promise. I just figured it's important to mention at least once. Now, photosynthesis is going to be using these chemical reactions where ultimately the reactants are light, water, and carbon dioxide. And by running it through those thylakoids and all that kind of fun stuff, it's going to ultimately generate oxygen and sugar. Now, there's two stages of photosynthesis. You have the light reaction and the carbon reaction. The light reaction is where light energy is captured and converted to chemical energy. And the carbon reaction is where this energy that was captured is then used to produce the sugar itself. Now, the light reaction begins with photosynthesis. The light reaction occurs when the thylakoids require water and light. Um, ATP and NADPH are going to produce to carry stored energy, and that oxygen gas is going to be formed as a byproduct. Basically, what happens is the light comes into the thylakoid, interacts with water and oxygen, or sorry, water and carbon dioxide. Um, it's going to create that oxygen that comes out, and then it's going to get to that uh, next step here in a second. So how exactly do these light reactions work? The pigment transfers energy to electrons. In other words, that pigment captures those photons and uses electrons to move energy from one part of the cell to the other. So light is first going to strike the, fir the first photosystem, PS2, for whatever reason, they did not name this easily. Uh, chlorophyll is going to absorb that light energy and transfer into those electrons, which come from water molecules. And then the electrons are going to be boosted to a high energy level, kind of like what happens in that electron transport chain. Then it's going to go through an electron transport chain, which is going to move um, the electrons kind of down a gradient, like we talked about. And as they're passed from carrier to carrier in the transport chain, potential energy in the electrons is going to be used to create protons, that H plus ion gradient that we've talked about in typical cellular respiration. That's why we talk about this second. Those H plus from the electron transport chain are going to pass through an enzyme called ATP synthase, which is, again, very similar to what we talked about with um, cellular respiration. And that ATP synthase is going to transport potential energy from the H plus gradient into chemical energy producing ATP. Meanwhile, the electrons from PS2 are going to, going to move to the PS1. So this is photosynthesis or photosystem one. When light hits PS1, chlorophyll is going to transfer light energy to the electrons. And those electrons are again going to be boosted to a high energy level. This is going to then move to a second electron transport chain where um, it's going to allow those electrons to move down a transportation gradient. And those electrons are going to uh, be reduced to NADP plus and NADPH. Now, ATP and NADPH are going to be what powers those carbon reactions so you can actually generate those glucose. So ATP and NADPH produced during the light reactions are going to carry that stored chemical energy derived from sunlight and to be used for the carbon or for the actual carbon reaction. In those carbon reactions, this energy is going to be used to break up the molecules of CO2 and then build molecules of sugar from it. This carbon reaction produces what we, the, the carbohydrates that we were talking about. This is primarily going to be in the form of glucose, but it's not always. Glucose is just usually the most simple monosaccharide that's easy to produce. This carbon reaction is going to occur in what they call the stroma, which is kind of the center of the chlorophyll. Sorry, the chloroplast itself. And that's going to be where the ATP and the NADPH from that light reaction are going to power that Calvin cycle, which is going to assemble those CO2 molecules into those carbohydrates. Now, carbon reactions ultimately require something called Rubisco. Now, Rubisco is an enzyme which allows for this carbon fixation to even be possible. So if you didn't have this, none of this is possible. Um, yes, I know that's a lot of information. Do not memorize it. This carbon fixation is going to be 
um, then occur where the carbon is removed from the molecules of CO2. And Rubisco enzymes are going to add CO2s onto molecules of what we call RUBP. That unstable six carbon mo or, uh, molecule are then produced. So you've got this unstable thing that's just kind of like barely holding itself together. So we're going to have to modify it slightly to keep it around. That's when we get to the PGAL synthesis, where small organic molecules are then going to be formed. So it's gonna take the NADPH and the ATP from those light reactions, or that's where they're gonna be ultimately used. And this energy is gonna be where they convert uh, PGA into PGA up. And that PGA is that weak you know, carbon molecule that's kind of barely holding on. The PGL is that more final form. It's a little bit more stable. Now, ultimately, once PGL leaves the cycle, Multiple PGALs are going to combine to form those molecules of glucose to create that simple sugar. Because that's the more stable version of it. You can slap a bunch of them together, and now you've got glucose. Okay. Now, RUBP is that five carbon sugar molecule, and some of the PGAL is used to reform the RUBP. So that way you can restart the cycle anew. You're not completely having to go back to the well and be totally SOL. Now, plants are going to use these sugars for many things. Remember, carbohydrates can be assembled in a wide variety of different ways. And how you put them together is the difference between something that's going to be a quick and easy way to store a little bit of energy, like something like glucose, or you get to things like starches or um, cellulose, which is such a very structured and highly you know, dense carbohydrate that it's really, really difficult to break down. In fact, it requires a ton of evolution for most organisms to be reliable herbivores, because a lot of plants have focused on generating cellulose, which humans aren't really able to break down at all, and very few mammals are able to. And the reason for that is, again, plants don't just want to be eaten, right? They want to be able to continue to exist and you know, make little plants. So how that cell or is going to ultimately repackage that glucose into all these different polysaccharides is very important. So you can see where like some of that stuff that we talked about, where it's like these very basic elements of chemistry and physics and all this stuff is coming into play now. I promise it was at least something different. Now remember, while we even though we might be moving on from this stuff, it still matters. And I'm trying to like make a point about that when I'm bringing in this example about fermentation or bringing in these examples about plants and how they've evolved and using their sugars in different ways. This is important to talk about and show you that you're going to be hearing a lot about these things, even if they're not necessarily, um, what's the word? Even if you're not necessarily going to see this exact same question that you're seeing now on the test later. Ultimately, just remember the photosynthesis includes both the light and the carbon reactions. That light reaction is going to be where the chlorophyll captures light energy and transfers it to the electrons forming ATP and NADPH. And that's where the oxygen is given off as a byproduct. Then you're going to have the carbon reaction, which is where uh, RUBP, powered by ATP and NADPH, removes those carbon atoms from a CO2 molecule and uses them to form sugar. This is the big picture that you really need to take home from this. Know the products, know the reactants, know how they kind of fit roughly in the grand scheme of things, but don't feel like you have to focus and learn how exactly RUBP pulls things apart. You should probably know what Rubisco is, but, you know just because it's so crucial to things. But remember, like the, the big picture stuff is what I'm trying to get y'all to take away from this. Now, plants use carbon asphyxiation in different ways. Now, predominantly all the plants on Earth right now that we study, at least, are going to do something called C3 process. This is the primary way that we talk about it. It's what you say, everything from trees, to to the primary way it's going to generate uh, glucose using photosynthesis. But there's other ways too. If you are a CAM plant, each of the photosynthesis uses different pathways to fix the carbon. So their light reactions aren't different, but their carbon path or reactions are. And there's a big reason for that. C4 plants and CAM plants primarily live in places where water is not readily accessible. So if you don't have that water, 
help break down that CO2 and be used for all these various electron transport chains? Now, each of these methods has their own advantage and disadvantages. Things like C4 and CAM, it's a little bit more energy costly and you don't produce as much glucose. But in situations where you have water, where you don't have water and it's a limiting factor, that's where you can take advantage of those situations. And that's where plants that are a C4 type plant might do better than a C3 plant normally would. And this is something we call niche partitioning, where these slight changes in the environment around an organism are gonna kind of help define where exactly the organism fits in the grand scheme of life. Now, a really cool example I always like talking about is not just, well, it's easy to look at algae, which is technically a protist, and a couple of other, you know, you need some other organisms in general. Those are pretty easy ones to kind of think about, right? But even then, weird relationships exist in science. So this is a really cool example of salamanders that they're actually really not all that far away from here. If you ever drive up to, say, past the fall line in Georgia, so driving north of Maine on I-75, this is where you're going to start seeing these little guys. You get about that big, and the right goes pop all the way down the back. They're really pretty. They're stupid easy to keep as pets. They're cute. Um, but what's really cool about them is that in certain places, they've evolved this relationship with algae, where the algae is deposited as the salamander will lay egg, or any acids, I should say, because it's kind of eggs. Um, and what that algae does is it produces sugars in photosynthesis. And through a symbiotic relationship between algae and impacts, it can pick up that glucose through a little growing faster. But two, these salamanders, they have about a week or two to keep their eggs from little circles out there, basically a single cellular, to little baby marble patch or and then come around and try these environments. In fact, it didn't take another moment to be able to get those rabbit dogs with the trees so they can take it out of the pond. So, in order for them to do that, the faster they can do it, the better. And the more efficiently they can put off the eggs and put them together. Because these salamanders and a lot of other organisms, we've got here, are reminded of what they call the salmon pond. So, these ponds are completely dry and steer. The three of the three ways, and 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 the three of the three it allows them to live in the areas, especially areas of these of them, and the ponds that say it's part of northern uh, North Carolina, Michigan, and the south and places like that. It allows them to grow really quickly. So ultimately, this is a really cool synthesis of that. That is something that is definitely pretty neat and I would pay for it. Never know when I might show back up. We can actually see this a little bit better. You see where this embryo is actually being implanted with all these tiny little algal uh, cells, and just the embryo by itself is going to grow uh, way, way slower. It's not going to be nearly the same. Right. So, quick reminder quiz three due on Sunday. I really encourage you all to take it earlier than that. And your exam is on Friday. If you have questions, please.